Welcome to the Engage Bible Podcast, hosted by the Roots Community Church. The Engage Bible Podcast exists to perpetuate knowing Scripture. Our hope is that through this podcast, you would be inspired to personally engage with your Bible and with fellow believers in conversation about Scripture. You can find out more about the Engage Bible Reading Plan and even download and print your own copy at engage.theroots.church. You can also contact us at engage at therootscommunity.com. Welcome to this week's episode of the Engage Bible Podcast. My name is Casey Ball. I'm here with Pastor Russ Newkirk. Yeah. Here I am. And today we are going to be talking about Mark chapters 2 and 3 and 1 Corinthians 3, three 4, 5, 6, 7. Yeah. A lot we, of we just first... the shorter the way you were going to say. You were just going to say 3 through 7, but I wanted to get the yeah. full extent there. Three, Some pretty four, short five, chapters Very in short. 1 Corinthians. Yeah. So mm-hmm. Not all of them, but most of them. Yeah. yeah. So we're excited. Um, mm-hmm. We mentioned last week... As we are looking at um, a different gospel that follows a, a very similar story, we will spend less time in the gospel, which for the last couple months, we've spent most of our time talking through Jesus's Same life. Same gospel, different writer. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's gospel. be clear. Yeah. Um, According to Mark. Mark 2 and 3, we want to look at chapter 3 a little bit, and are we looking at That's the chapter beginning three. of chapter 3? Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we, we're just going to skip through some, because like you said, we've we've uh, covered a lot of these before already. So um, chapter 3 at the beginning talks about Jesus, comes right on the back end of him see, saying that he's the Lord of the Sabbath. That's so awesome. Yeah. And then, and then he shows that uh, by healing on the Sabbath. But it's interesting because it shows you emotion that Jesus had as he's dealing with some of the religious, the Pharisees. Yeah. The self-righteous. And it's cool to see Jesus get angry. Sure. <laughs> what? Is it? I don't know. It I is. know what you mean. Yeah. Uh, so, so I'll just I'll start at the beginning. It's not a sin to be angry, but the Bible says, in your anger, do not sin. Right. We don't do that very well. No. Yeah. They usually are uh, highly Especially connected you. for us. Yeah, right. I get angry. Yeah, watch out. Hangry. <laughs> no, that, hangry. No, that might be real. Um, no, but you're, you're right. For us, anger usually really quickly, sometimes it stems from sin. Totally. Often. It stems from sin in our own lives, our own hearts, our own issues, and then it turns to sin from there. <laughs> right. So just the double up on some sin there in the anger sandwich. There we go. So um, the sin sandwich. Yeah. So sin buffet. Jesus though is without sin. Yep. And so we see here that he is. He does have anger, and he's deeply distressed, and he at their stubborn hearts. The Bible says um, because what he's what he's asked is this guy has a hand that is shriveled, and he asks. If it's right to basically heal this guy, he says it differently right. in this context, but um, that's that's what he's asking. Is it is it okay to do right, right. on the Sabbath? And they remain silent because they don't want to respond because they're kind of waiting what he's going to do because they're ready to pounce on any decision that he might make or say, right? And, and then it says, yeah, in verse 5, chapter 3, he looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored, mm-hmm. which again is just so yeah, but completely restored. Yeah. Anyway, I, I could camp on that, but yeah. Sure. And I think I think we may have talked about it yeah. in Matthew, but I love how Mark puts it together a little little quicker and also just kind of highlights the, the tension already between Jesus and the Pharisees. Pharisees. Right, with that next verse there, even more, right? Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. We're at the beginning of pretty chapter early three. Here. Yeah. And earlier, uh, the well, in chapter two, you see Jesus going back and forth with the Pharisees already. So I just love the uh, I love the emotion. Sure. And again, in Jesus is frustrated that the Pharisees are they don't want good to happen on a specific day of the week because of their wicked hearts, their their yeah. stubborn hearts. Right. Um, so I, so Jesus is saying this guy's got a shriveled hand. Do you care mm-hmm. about this person, or do you only care about these religious rituals? Right. And so it's pretty, yeah, it's pretty intense. Pretty dope. Yeah. So then uh, it, it goes right into um, Jesus going to a lake and a, a bunch of people are following him. Um, all, all of the people in this area are, are beginning to hear about Jesus's healing ministry. And this is a time when people didn't live long. 
There were lots of diseases that could easily take you out, and they're following Jesus because they want him to heal them. Totally. So, um... They, um, I'll just start at verse nine because the, cr- uh, because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him so he can push off out onto the water, um, to keep the people from crowding him for he had healed many so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. Whenever the impure spirit saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, you are the son of God. It's so awesome. Yeah. But this, the demonic, I mean, the impure spirits inside recognize that he is the Messiah, that he's. God the Son, and but they fall down and cry out, yeah. and then Jesus not wanting that to be, it's not time yet for that to be fully known for everybody in that way, um, he gives them strict orders not to tell others about it. Right. Mark um, kind of paints this picture early that uh, not until later do the disciples start to figure out that Jesus is the Son of God, Sure, but very early on, um, he uh, points out that that the the demons that he's casting out acknowledge Jesus's true identity. Right. So that's awesome. Mm-hmm. And then jumping down to kind of around verse 20, an interesting story. Um, I'll just read it. Then Jesus entered a house and again, a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. That, that sucks. Yeah. Go into a house to eat and like the people... There's so many people. Like, what does that look like? Can't you can't even, even use your, your utensils or yeah. what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming it's just so crowded. How do you get the food from the kitchen to the, to the table? It gets, eat, it gets eaten before it gets there. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it, it's a packed house, um, so much that they're not even eating. And it says, when his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said he is out of his mind. They went to take charge of him. Like, we're just going to grab you and yeah. you're out. Yeah. Well, this isn't good for you, Jesus. You can't even eat. Look at all these people everywhere. He's out of his mind. That's his family. Right. But then Jesus would go on after being accused by the teachers of the law of being possessed by Satan. So first he's called out of his mind by his own family Mm -hmm. and then possessed by the teachers of the law. But later on, he'll uh, talk about who his family is. In fact, in verse 31, it says, then Jesus, excuse me, uh, yeah. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived, standing outside. They sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers? He asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. It's awesome. Yeah. Not to say that his own family wasn't his. He wasn't saying His family. Yeah. But it's cool that inclusion, and in, in we see that continue in the rest of the New Testament. Even Paul will talk about in First Corinthians the the kind of family terms of mother, brother, sister, father. Sure, it's cool. Yeah, it's very cool. That was the that was super quick. Yeah, that was Mark. That was the that's Mark what Mark is all about. That we're gonna look at. Yes, yeah, true. <laughs> Breakneck so, speed. First Corinthians. Man, there's three, four, so five, much six and seven. Awesome stuff. Mm-hmm. To talk about here, First Corinthians. We mentioned last week there that the, the cr- church in Corinth is kind of wild, and Paul is going to address some issues. And so, when you're reading, we may not cover s- some of the things that you may read and go, "What the heck is he talking about?" Um, Paul's pretty frustrated with them at this point in the letter, and he's giving them some pretty sharp rebuke. Uh, it's pretty awesome. So, yeah, it's just starting at chapter three. I think we should read. Probably this starting main, from... This has been your main line so far in this podcast today. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to edit it out. Don't worry uh, about it. No, leave it. I love yeah. it. You know, here's kind of the topic, and I think I'll just read. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just going to start at the beginning of chapter So if you're listening to the Bible three. on tape uh, with Casey Ball... No, I just love what he says here. Yeah. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? Mere humans. For when one says, I follow a uh, Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? Hmm. Um, and he, we, we talked about that a little bit last week. He addresses that before in the mm-hmm. letter of there being some like dispute over um, kind of that We call it a celebrity pastor. Celebrity pastor. Like, oh, well, you know, I follow Paul's teaching. Well, I follow Jesus's teaching. Mm -hmm. And um, he just kind of cuts to the chase and just says, like, guys, like, we're going to talk about some things and let's just knock it off. Let's just stop. Sure. Stop being worldly. It's interesting here because he says mere infants in Christ. So he does is saying that they are in Christ. 
Yes. But he's saying, like, you haven't grown. Mm-hmm. So you're in Christ, but you're still worldly. Like, you haven't been being sanctified, basically, mm-hmm. is what it sounds like. Like, mm-hmm. you're not reflecting the image of Christ any more than when I first addressed you. Right. And then he goes on that his example is that they're uh, quarreling and jealousy and that they're, you know, kind of still playing this, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos thing. Mm-hmm. He'll go on and say, what after all is Apollos and what is Paul? Only servants Mm -hmm. through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. That's great. Yeah. We're just, all we did was what we were supposed to do. Right. The Lord gets the credit. Mm -hmm. I planted the seed, Apollos watered, but God has been making it grow. So So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. Mm Mm-hmm. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. Mm -hmm. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. Mm -hmm. So great. Yeah. Just, I mean, it's, I love that he's pulling them off of the pedestal. Mm -hmm. Like, don't make much of us. This is about God. I was reading in our um, Multiplying Churches book, Matt Chandler brings up the same thing of like, I've noticed that when I make much of God, men try to make much of me. Hmm. Um, And I love how he just is like, guys, it's not about this. It's about it's about God. It's about God's what God's doing. Um, We're just workers. Totally. Um, And I think that uh, that's something that the the Big C Church doesn't always do super well right now. Why do you think that is? Um, do we already talk about the answer to this? I don't know. <laughs> Folks, we have to apologize for our lack of memory. Uh, if we don't remember it, they that can hopefully don't remember it either regularly. No, I mean, I, I think uh, people long. Well, we're built to praise. Mm-hmm. So where does it land? Right. It's a good, good thought. And so I think that's one reason it's easy to have something tangible that it lands on. So I think that's one reason that there ends up being the I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, or similar today as there's certain pastors or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, because there's just a there's a like that person's ministry had an effect on totally which it does i mean it's got work i mean he, he that's how he lays it out here right like that happened sure he worked through us according to god's plan right and the task that he's given us but that god would get all the credit in all of it because mm-hmm. he's the one that has us grow at all and sure. reveals himself to to us through people's um gifts and skills and the teaching of the gospel but that we can easily fall into that i think the great thing about what he's saying here is like you said that uh, or you said that chandler said <laughs> <laughs> It's now a Casey quote. No, I think one of the beauties of it is that it shows, too, that anybody can be used by God. It's going to be in a different space, like a a different way, maybe, but they all work together. Right. And I I think it helps when we pull people down off the pedestal, Mm -hmm. which sounds harsh when you say pull somebody off of a pedestal, but uh, when we just keep kicking the legs out of the pedestal, whatever it is, that I think it helps everybody realize, man, God is awesome. There's a part that I can play in the great work that he does, whether it's the planting or the, you know, the planter or the water or the the different analogies used here. I can do something. I can play my part. I don't have to play all the parts. Sure. I can play my part and God works through that Mm. for the saving. And it's all necessary. Yeah. And God has gifted. And they're rewarded based on what they do, it says. Right. So it's good. Yeah. 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 I love how he brings brings it into what the gospel is. Mm. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. I just think that that's awesome that he brings it into what it really is. Like, it's not about me. It's not about Apollos. This is about Jesus. Yeah. And he obviously keeps on going there. He just talks about what you build and how it holds up. And then I love in verse 16 and 17, he speaks, well, let's just read it as Casey would say, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person for God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. Yeah. I think that's great because we're going to see in a couple chapters that he says that, that you were bought at a price and that your body is the temple of the spirit. Yeah. And so we'll see both kind of the the singular saved person be the temple of the Holy Spirit and the gathering of believers, the assembly of the saints, the the church itself is the temple mm-hmm. in which his spirit is in our midst. Awesome. And so his spirit indwells all believers and is amongst those that are believers. And so it's just, yeah, it's just really cool. And then obviously God's heart for his people. And like we were talking before we jumped on the microphones, 
that if he's the one building all of it, that he's the one that you have to deal with if you destroy what he's building. <laughs> right? I, th- I think that's something to be mindful of because oftentimes people have bad things to say about the church. Yeah. You might want to watch your mouth. Not that there's not some issues that need to be taken care of. Not that there's not appropriate ways that those are taken care of. But oftentimes people want to just go after the church. Oh, the church this, the church that. Be careful how you go about that and what you're saying about that. And again, churches, there's no perfect church. Sure. And so there's going to be issues that need to be addressed and dealt with. But it's saying here that God's f- followers, is the, the, those that are in his family, are his temple, and that he deals with that if you um, destroy it. I think that's good. And I think even from, I'm, I'm thinking through, I tend to be critical of other church camps, hmm. you know, who... who Sorry, church camps sound like they go somewhere for the summer for a week or two. Sorry. <laughs> other churches or... Other tr- or tribes, tradition uh, tribes, w- yeah, whatever yeah. you you want to call them, denominations or um, networks. Th- I mean, it, you don't have to look very far within the Christian world to see that there's lots of different kind of spinoffs. Mm-hmm. Some people, so, you know, some churches, some pastors, some theologians are kind of crunchy. Some are pretty fruity. <laughs> Like, well, let's you, just say it how food? it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Some are touchy-feely. Some of, sure. some don't w- want to even... Some are all heady. Yeah. Some are um, just emotionally driven. Right. There's going to be a, a whine or sure. a cry and everything, because yeah. that's just kind of how they are. Right. Some will never show that. They're almost stoic. Yeah. If they do show emotion, it's frustration. No, yeah, there's, th- there's all kinds of... And I think we can differentiate even within that large group to false gospels. Sure. Cults, things like that. Because there's some open-handed issues that wouldn't be a false gospel. It mm-hmm. would just... It's playing out a little bit differently inside of a congregation. And then there's some that are closed-handed issues that are different, which would be not... That, that would be focused on things that aren't the gospel inside of those places. Totally. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how that does that thought. affect what you're kind of thinking there? Uh, I think I just need to probably be a little more careful about my assessment hmm. to really understand those churches and those groups before I am trying to make any sort of conclusions. Sure. One of my leadership strengths, curses, whatever you want to say. <laughs> One of my spiritual gifts, according to the <laughs> Kazone assessment, was um, discernment. Hmm. And I tend to always analyze and look at things through a lens of negativity, hmm. and uh, I'm just prone to that. So you find the wrong. Right. You don't necessarily ever discern the good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you could easily give the four things that were off on something. It's but. really easy for me to look at something and go, here's what's wrong with it, and so I don't want to... Sure. I don't, I don't want that, sure. you know? Um, and, uh, and I think it's, I, th- I think it's good for me to continue to be clear on what that is and what that isn't. Hmm. Like I said, false, false gospels obviously are not what Paul's talking about sure, the because Paul will later is. go on to say like, Hey, false teachers and false prophets like identify that like know know who they are and protect your flock from that i think the hardest thing in that is that the verbiage is so similar in um what you just said is a false gospel i mean they would still say that jesus christ is the way to be saved oftentimes the thing what you're talking about here that and are we what are we talking about right now false gospel are we talking like prosperity gospel Sure. Is that what they're about? I'm saying that that's why it's confusing for people. Sure. Is because if we say Jesus Christ is the foundation, that's what that's also what they would say. So I could see how it could be confusing for somebody even listening to this. Sure. Going, well, how do I know yeah. what's really going on here in that space? Sure. And that's also the problem, not just with a prosperity gospel, um, but with... Uh, well, even on the other end, I think it just a straight out, if you have to be like a poverty gospel is wrong. I think that, well, and then there's, there's Christian cults mm-hmm. who also would say Jesus Christ is the foundation. Mm-hmm. And so I think there's a lot of things that uh, could be confusing in that space. And so I think it's, it's very vital that we understand what we're saying when we're saying that. Sure, sure. So we made a lot of decisions. <laughs> no, I think it's, I think it's good. I think it's a healthy conversation and is one that we've been having offline, you know, um, outside of this podcast is, you know, how do we become more clear about what the Bible says and what it doesn't say. Right. Um, and I think that it's important that we continue to draw our beliefs from what the scri- authority of Scripture. Right. <laughs> what the Bible says Agreed. alone. Yeah. And those other Gospels that are, are preached, um, in fact, I think I, it's, I did for just a moment, spoke about it on Sunday, is that it, it's oftentimes who's the center of that Gospel? Is, is Christ, is God 
is his glory mm-hmm. what it's all about or is it all about you right and that's usually kind of the the telltale sign of i don't even know what that means what i just said of okay i should look more into this that yes it is for our best benefit that we would put our faith in our trust in jesus christ as lord and it is all about his glory that we boast in him and get on his mission that might cost us everything but it's not so that like god god didn't send christ so that we could have a piggy bank total or a genie right or whatever that looks like that um, and what normally happens then all of a sudden it's a, a, a gospel that has humans at the center. Right. And so now God has to do whatever we tell him because, well, essentially what you're saying then is that we're God, not himself at all. I think it was. I mean, we didn't give a lot of answers. So. No, that's-, <laughs> <laughs> that's it's it's a big onion to peel well, on we're gonna one We're going to keep going through every week as we go through this podcast. So yeah. we're not going to go through all of it right now. But that the good news of Jesus Christ, Mm -hmm. God made us out of the overflow of the loving relationship that he had with himself. He made mankind, that mankind has sinned um, against God, and the wage of sin is death. And uh, instead of us having to receive that punishment on ourselves, God sent Christ out of his great love that we could receive his love through Christ because Jesus took the wrath for our sins, Mm -hmm. um, rightfully due for our sins on the cross um, in our place, that he died, that he was raised again three days later, uh, that he was seen and that was confirmed, right. uh, that he ascended into heaven and sits on the throne. Yeah. Zoop. That, that was him that, ascending. That, that, was the, that was the speed of him ascending. Yeah. Zoop. And that should have an effect on our life. You yeah. know what I mean? And so, uh, yeah, there's the 20 second help. Boom. I love how he just settles it, kind of brings it all together. Um, verse 21. So then no more boasting about human leaders. That's so awesome. And then he lists some and, uh, and, and then at the, the beginning of chapter four, verse one, he tells them how to how to treat them. This then is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ and those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. Hmm. So that's cool. So cool. Man, so where should we go? Let's keep moving. Let's jump to uh, chapter four, verse uh, kind of around 14 there. I think it's pretty great because uh, what Paul says, let's go to 15. Even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. Yeah. For in Christ... Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Just an interesting statement. Uh, Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. So he says, you don't have these people to set you this example. You might have... um, a lot of guardians in Christ, but who do you have that's really um, in like that father son relationship raising you up in the ways of what it looks like to follow Jesus? Mm-hmm. And which is great because he, he explains that the, with the next line to say, imitate me. And that's what fathers and sons do. Right. And we've, uh, I don't know if we pointed it out on this podcast or not, I'll probably say that a lot, is that the verbiage in scripture shifts from that of making disciples to a father-son relationship, um, specifically as it goes out to the Gentiles. Um, so he's basically saying here, I'm going to bring you alongside, and I'm going to show you the ropes. I'm going to raise you in what it looks like to follow after Christ, right. which is what we would say dis- discipleship is. Right. And, and he follows that up by saying, for this reason I have sent to you Timothy, my son whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. Not his biological son. This is one of his disciples. Right. But he calls him son. Right. So he says, okay, you don't have many fathers. I'm that because of the gospel. Imitate what I've done. I'm going to send you my son who already has followed in my footsteps, that already imitates me. Mm-hmm. So you'll see what it looks like. You'll be reminded of what it looks like again hmm. if you already have forgotten. <laughs> Which or, they apparently have. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's great how that works. And then it, it makes a lot of sense too because he'll keep going and he's going to confront some things going on there. And part of the role of a father is to confront things in his kids when they're off base. Right. <laughs> You know what I mean? And so that's kind of how it goes because he, he says, I'm going to send Timothy, who, whom I love, who's faithful in the Lord. He'll remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. He said, my works line up with my words of the gospel. And then he goes on to go after, apparently some of them are becoming arrogant. And he, he says, I'm coming. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I'll find out not only how these arrogant people are talking, but what power they have. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. Hmm. Did you want to sing I Got the Power right there? Because I, I did. I got the power. Thanks, Casey. That was beautiful. Is that how it goes? Is that, yeah. Is that the melody? That's what I was thinking. Okay. Yeah. Great job. What do you prefer? Shall I come to you with a rod of discipline or shall I come in love and with a gentle spirit? Hmm. So he's saying like, figure it out. Yeah. Because I'm coming there and I'm going to deal with it. Right. I'd like to come loving. Yeah. You know what I mean? But if you stay in this place, then as your father, I'm bringing a switch. Right. Yeah. That's kind of what he's saying. 
<laughs> yeah. It's giving them options. Totally. Yeah. Hey, deal with this stuff. Put yourself in check or I'm yeah. going to come put you in check. Yeah. Which as a parent, you can totally understand <laughs> those lines. Don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's, that's me and my son right now. Yeah. We need to put your pants on, son. His son's two. Yeah. <laughs> that's your point no, that I don't want to. Yeah. Would you like are to you go on time out? It? Yeah. Yeah. If you do it, things are going to go well. If you don't. Right. Because your gonna options be right now are pants or time out. Which right. one would you like? Right. <laughs> right. That's what Paul is saying. <laughs> Well, but, I'm gonna actually, write it's funny that you say that because it goes straight into sexual immorality. So here we go. No, I want to point uh, out uh, <laughs> something real quick as you're saying that I'm thinking just in terms Uh-oh. of, uh, well, Paul has said in, in chapter three that they're like spiritual infants. Right. I gave you milk. Like you're not ready for food. Right. Um, and, and that's kind of a theme throughout the New Testament is is new Christians being spiritually born again born again yeah. and learning how to walk and you can kind of use that analogy as far as you want with um the christian life of totally. when you're a brand new christian you're you're just learning and absorbing so much and mm-hmm. um i don't need to get into the whole analogy right now but um i love the idea of spiritual fatherhood and sonship um and i th- as you were talking about it it made me think through i've always thought through that in terms of age Hmm. And it's really not about that. Um, I think the spiritual father is just someone who has been walking with Jesus longer. And the spiritual son is somebody that they're discipling um, and teaching how to follow Jesus. Sure. I think it's naturally easier if someone's younger, but it's not necessary. Sure. And... Like, we're pretty close in age. Uh, well, you're kind of old. But, you know, when I was in my late teens, you were that for me. Like, my dad loves sure. Jesus and walks with the Lord. Sure. And, um, but when you're a teenager, who do you hear from? Right. You know, who's following Jesus and says, right. like, let's do this thing. Probably something really awesome. Shut <laughs> up. <laughs> oh, man. No, that's Ooh. true. And I think I had that same line with you. Uh, what would you prefer? <laughs> Shall yeah. I come to you with a rod of discipline? Or shall I come in love with a gentle spirit? No, I just think um, thinking through it, like it just it doesn't have to do with with age. And I think that sometimes people feel uncomfortable. Totally, we would probably call this more like mentoring now. Sure, you know, um, mentoring somebody their own age. Because there's like that kind of awkwardness. What are they going to think about this? Um, being led by somebody younger than you or the same age as you or close to age as you is... Swallow your pride. Yeah. And it shouldn't It shouldn't be an issue of pride. Like that's... I think that's sin. Sure. Pride? Yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just... Uh, yeah, you're right. It is, it is just pride. But... Uh, <laughs> Anyways, that was what came to my head. That's awesome. So the next thing they do is they deal with a very interesting (laughs) thing that's going on inside of the church in Corinth. There's incest happening. And apparently, people are okay with it. That They're tolerating something that that Paul says that pagans, so unbelievers, wouldn't even tolerate this, but you guys are tolerating it. And he says, shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put out of your fellowship the man who has been doing this? And then he says, basically, I'm not there, but I am there. Mm-hmm. I'm not there physically, but kind of as that father role, mm-hmm. um, I'm there with you in the right decision you should be making, and sure. you need to make it yeah. with my presence there with you, kind of an idea, right? right. So, and then he may, he has this line that I'd like you to explain to us, Casey. Perfect. Uh, no, he says I will. in verse five, hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. Mm-hmm. I love it. Yeah. I think it's... I shouldn't say I love it. It's heartbreaking. No, no, yeah, yeah. But I think it's... um, Is it the idea of like hoping that they kind of hit rock bottom? That's what it is. Yeah, I think so that's So they become the, the prodigal son. Right. Quit trying to make it okay for this person because you're wanting to like coddle their sin. Yeah. And hand them over to Satan so that their flesh will be complete. Like, let them feel the pain of their decision. Right. What they're doing is completely wrong Mm -hmm. in hopes that their spirit may be saved. And so it sounds brutal, but it's only brutal if it's not thinking of the eternal purpose right. of why that would happen. Because he says you could, you should have kicked this guy out of your fellowship. Right. Like you shouldn't let this guy say he's a brother or sister in Christ because mm-hmm. he's, he's not following that at all. And he's doing things that are wicked as can be. So it's just interesting. And then he even says in verse 6, your boasting is not good. There, are they boasting of this guy being there? That's nuts. Nuts. But it goes on to, to something that I think, you know, that maybe you think right now, okay, that doesn't really <laughs> pertain or fit into my context. Give it but, a couple of years. But look at, uh, geez, look at uh, verse 9 through 13. 
says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. And sexual immorality is, again, um, it's a big catch-all bucket of all sexual sin, which is any and all sexual activity outside of what God ordained it as, which is a husband and wife, a man and woman in a marriage relationship. And so he says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. So he's saying like, okay, no, you're supposed to be around other people Mm -hmm. and other people in the world we shouldn't expect them to live as followers of christ they don't know jesus but then he goes on and says but now i am writing to you that you must not associate associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister but is sexually immoral or greedy an idolater a slanderer a drunkard or swindler do not even eat with such people what business Is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked person from among you. Man. And he uses the verbiage and expel the wicked from among you from the Old Testament. As as God has called Israel to be pure, Hmm. that they would say, if there's this person doing impurities that uh, could spread amongst the people, Mm -hmm. then it'd be best for the people to remove that person from the people. Hmm. It's It's... it's right. so outside of what our um, kind of politically correct HR world that we live in now. Mm-hmm. I think too often we would say, okay, that person's an open sin saying they're a believer, but maybe if we just um, love them back to the, uh, like just love them through it and maybe they'll finally get it. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's saying to confront it. Right. And, and that, is, that is what's loving. Right, right. And that doesn't mean, you know, I mean, other places we'll see when someone's stuck in sin, come along them, bear the burden with them and do those types of things for sure. Mm-hmm. But none of those are talking about like coddling the person in their sin. Mm-hmm. They're saying if this person claims to be a believer, right, then and and they're living crazy, don't associate with that because that's not really somebody living for Christ. It's a really happy podcast. Yeah. <laughs> um, right, false gospel. Yeah. Earlier and then. <laughs> don't don't glorify your leaders and and yeah. now incest. And I think it's um it's interesting. Well, this isn't just incest here, There's, though, because he says also right. greed or idolaters or slanders or drunkards or swindlers. So, first of all, I wonder if it's the same letter that uh, a few months ago in Acts we talked about. In Acts 15, the church writes letters to Gentile believers and mm. tells them to not be sexually immoral. Sure. So he said, I wrote to you. That might be part of it. We're going to see later, though, that they, they've written to him. And so mm-hmm. I don't know how many correspondents they've had back and forth right i want those but <laughs> uh, those. it's uh it's it, this interesting tension that uh Jesus ate with the tax collectors. Mm-hmm. Uh, in Mark, we, we didn't read it, but the Pharisees get in Jesus's business because he's eating uh, with Matthew mm-hmm. at, at Matthew's house. Mm-hmm. And so, and here Paul is with saying... tax collectors and sinners. Yeah. And here Paul is saying, like, don't, don't associate with them. And so... But it says right above that, not at all meaning those of this world. Right. Yeah. And I think that's where we have to differentiate. Sure. Like, our, like the person that they, they need to kick out of their church church because of his shameful the incest. sin he's he's sleeping with his uh-huh. m- his father's wife uh-huh uh but not that they should forget about him but you're and and you've already said like it's in hopes that he'll become the, the prodigal the whole goal in all yeah. of that is that he would understand as the, that's a great example as the prodigal son did as he's eat, you know longing to eat the pig slop mm-hmm and all of a sudden, he has this revelation. There, there's a better space than where I'm at right now. Right, right. I've brought myself to the bottom. Right. And it's better for me to just ask for forgiveness and turn back. Right. Um, and then it's with open arms. Of course, yeah, it's always with open arms. Sure. We're always longing for reconciliation. Right. In all of those spaces. But I thought it was just good to kind of land on that a little bit because I think too often inside of the church, um, and, and we should be known for the love that we have for each other, the Bible says, mm-hmm. but I think we too often make love mean that everything is acceptable. Sure. I would never allow my son to do whatever he wanted mm-hmm. because I love him. Right, right. It's because I love him that I would not allow for it. Right. And so you see that as God loves us and still has these commands mm-hmm. that he calls us to follow after him, and, and we fail along the way. Sure. 
But this is hoping that someone would turn towards repentance. Right. This is confronting someone where they're at, um, which we talked about, I don't know how many weeks ago now in Matthew, but the idea of bringing it to somebody in hopes that they would repent. Right. That they would understand how far off they are and what their actions are, um, that God has called them to something greater than where they're at. Um, and I don't want to say that it's one that's like up on again, like a pedestal. Sure. I need someone to do that to me if I'm off base. Like that's healthy mm-hmm. that we have loving relationships that we can go, hey, what you're doing, not good. Mm-hmm. And, and and you need to deal with that. We're going to go ahead and hand you over to Satan. Hand you <laughs> over. <laughs> Bo. So here's Satan. Satan? <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, we should uh, jump through a couple quick things and then, uh, and then be done. call it a day. Yeah. yeah. So uh, after that, it talks about law- lawsuits among believers which is a pretty interesting space because he says, why would you take it to somebody that doesn't follow God's law? Like, why would you take it to somebody that's just going to give you a, a worldly judgment? Mm-hmm. Isn't there people inside of the church that could help you come to the, the, the correct co- conclusion? Right. And that we're not a good example to unbelievers when that's the space that we're in. Right. And we show again our immaturity. Right. And then uh, it talks about sexual immorality again. I don't think we need to land on that too long. I think before that, though, verse 11, he kind of stops and and pauses again and reminds them of who they are in Christ. Totally. So he lists out all these different sins. That he says, Um, these people won't inherit the kingdom of God. Right. And that is what you once were. This is verse 11. That is what some of you were, but you were washed and you were sanctified and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. So, um, and then he goes right back into it. (laughs) Sure. But I think he's just trying to make sure that they understand these are, these are things you need to deal with and you're doing it wrong because the issue is... That's not who you are. Like, you're right. not living as who you are. Let me remind you one more time. Yeah. Here's who you are. You're dumb, you're dumb, you're dumb, you're dumb, you're dumb. And Christ washed you. Yeah. And you're dumb. <laughs> yeah. Quit being dumb. Yeah. Oh, man. We we need the same advice. <laughs> totally. And then you mentioned earlier how he talks about... Uh, the temple. The temple. Yeah, that we're the temple. As the kind of the gathering. The, yeah, in your midst, right. in yourselves as a, as a group. Mm-hmm. Um, and then here, in starting in verse 18 of chapter 6, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. Whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Because hmm. I didn't have to read that to make this one make sense, but that's just an add-on right there. Yeah. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Mm. Man, it's awesome. So this is a big deal because another big push in our day and in our culture is all Tattoos. about... No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you and your, like your own dis- decisions about your own body. Mm. And, totally. And, Let's uh, go there. Yeah. No, I, I, I think that's a big deal that it, as Christians... So, like, obviously, the way I just said that brings up the idea of abortion. Yeah. And as Christians, when, when someone says, like, well, that's my body, I shouldn't have to do whatever, then you don't understand who you are as a Christian. As a Christian, your body is not your own, the Bible says, and that it should honor God in all ways possible. And right mm-hmm. here is talking about sexual immorality also, which mm-hmm. I think is a whole nother way we could talk about how that connects with abortion most often. And I know that the, the topic of abortion is uh, not fun to have a conversation about most times. but I, I'm not I, afraid of it. Uh, but biblically, yeah. um, that it, it speaks regularly in scripture of people being purposed before they're even born Mm. um, and and then knitting together in the womb and these different um, scriptures Mm. that uh, solidify the personhood. Right. Um, John the Baptist in the womb Mm -hmm. leaps because of the Holy Spirit that's already on him, in him, in the womb. Right. Like that shows you the personhood of him um, as it confirms that Christ is in Mary's womb. Mm -hmm. David talks about you knit me together and my mother's womb. Right. Yeah. Right. That I was me before this. Right. Before I was born. So so there's that spot of personhood, but that in this, that, uh, you know, I think you should probably think about this both ways as you as you hear this and as you read it, that not only is my body God's because it was there was a price that was paid mm-hmm. and his Holy Spirit lives inside of me. And, and so this temple is his, mm-hmm. um, but also others sure. that we would respect what that means for others. Right. I think is. Yeah. And I think we're bringing this topic up and I'm feeling mad over 
over here about it, and uh, <laughs> this is a topic that kind of stirs me. Me too. And I just want to say, and you typically will do this when I'm kind of going after something on this podcast, of, of if you have been in that space previously, previously in your life, then, uh, you know, Christ's work on the cross has, has paid for all of that, and... If you are a, if you would consider yourself a Bible believing, Jesus following, loving Christian, um, and you have mixed views on this topic, I would urge you to reconsider those um, because this topic, I think, is a biblical issue. It is because it has to do with the sanctity of life and murder. Yeah, um, which the Bible is very clear. From Genesis, it nails down. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, and and this is unfortunately a topic that has started to become more liberal within the church, just like every social. Well, because it's a do what you want, whatever works for you. Yeah. Idea. So culture has invaded the church, which yeah. sucks. Oh, it's horrible. Because if Paul was alive today, he'd be writing he'd the off. same letter and should say, bring, "Shame on you." Should I bring a rod? Yeah, I'm bringing my rod. Let's yeah. go. <laughs> yeah, the rod of discipline. Let's make this happen. Well, and I. I, th- I think you referenced it just now, but when if you look back to the verse you just read a moment ago in verse 11, and that is what some of you were. Mm-hmm. So he lists all these um, sinful, wicked spaces that all of us have come from, and that the, the grace of God is bigger than the level of our sins. Totally. So that, like you said... If you if that's something you have done, um, his grace is sufficient, mm. and that but that there is a level of repentance that is I turn from those ways of the world, right? And I'm putting my faith in Christ Jesus mm. and a follower of Him mm. as Lord. Yeah. Well, that was uh, that, that's but, that's where we should cut it. Yeah, probably. And yeah. then, yep, chapter seven will will not chapter really seven talk is about. really great. It is. There's great stuff in there, and I think uh, about. Marriage, a lot about marriage. Again, it kind of starts with your bodies. You're in marriage, how you've uh, kind of given yourself to the person, what that looks like. Mm-hmm. Um, he'll talk uh, a bit about the how big of a deal marriage is, that you mm-hmm. don't get to just leave or walk away from it. Mm-hmm. Um, but then he will say that if an unbeliever walks away from a marriage, uh, that the believer could allow them to walk away. Mm-hmm. And there's, you know, an interesting line in there in chapters or verse 16, which I probably shouldn't read because you said we should be done. Uh, <laughs> how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your life? Mm-hmm. Basically saying that if your spouse does not believe, you have a mission field in your own home. Right, right. And so you shouldn't walk away. You're right, right. You should continue there long term in hopes that your proclamation of the gospel and your your works that line up with the gospel mm-hmm. will God will work through to save your spouse. Right. But that if they leave, then you're free from chasing them. Sure. Yeah. It's yeah. just a, a freeing yeah. statement, honestly. Yep. Uh, and then I'll go to other things about singleness and marriage. And yeah. um, I, I highly recommend that everybody reads it. Yeah. <clears throat> we got to read verse 39. Verse 39. Sure. A woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes, but he must belong to the Lord. And so, you know, we've just seen people get unequally yoked with non-Christians. They're following Jesus. They... They begin a relationship with somebody who isn't. Right. And it tends to do damage. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I think this is an interesting thing because he's talking to believers and he just made the statement of, you know, maybe you're already in a relationship and then you get saved. Mm -hmm. Then you understand who Christ is. Well, that's a hard journey, but if that person leaves, then you're free, right? So he's kind of talking to a person that's saved in this. I mean, Mm -hmm. he's talking to somebody that knows Christ. Right. Right. So that if you're if you're married and um, know Jesus and your spouse dies, that you're free to marry again, mm-hmm. but that in doing so, you're free to marry as long as that person loves Jesus. He's a believer, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, because yeah, he cares. I mean, he, right. he he's saying even if you know even if they weren't a believer before mm-hmm. the other you know the spouse that passed away, you are, mm-hmm. and so you need to live accordingly in that. Yeah, so it's awesome. We love you guys. We talked about some tough stuff today. Tough stuff, and we're Can going to pray for us before we get done. A here? tough letter, yeah, yeah, for sure. Let's do that. All right, God, we just thank you for your word. Um, and even when we walk through hard spaces in your word, we know that it is out of love that you have given it to us, um, that you would get glory in in our understanding of and our walking out the word that you have given us, and that we would benefit that it is uh, out of love that you've given it to us, uh, and in a response of love that we obey your commands. Um, God, I also just pray for healing for maybe somebody that finds themselves in some of these spaces today, um, a hard space of, of marriage 
bridge that seems to be a mission field or of uh, dealing with some some sin and an uninformed understanding of the sanctity of life um, or in uh, making a, a leader into some sort of something they're not. Um, God, and many of the other things we read today, I, I just, I thank you for your grace and your mercy and forgiveness. And I, I thank you that uh, you let us know that if, in in. First John, that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us of all unrighteousness. So God, in all of our hearts, I, I know that there's things um, that, that we need to give to you. And so I just pray that anybody listening right now, whenever, wherever they're listening, uh, would, would deal with the things in our heart that your word is exposed, as, as you've said in your word that it would do, that it would deal with uh, our hearts and our thoughts and our motives. And um, God, as it's happened, I thank you that you've just uh, covered that uh, by the blood of Christ, that we are sanctified, that we are new. Um, help us to live according to where we stand as sons and daughters of yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you guys. See you next week. Peace. Thank you for listening to this week's Engage Bible Podcast. We pray it is a blessing to you. We encourage you to go now and participate in your own reading of Scripture and engage with fellow believers in Bible conversations. As a reminder, you can access and print a copy of the Engage Bible Reading Plan at engage.theroots.church.